Hi everybody, I'm BJ from the Maine State Library. I'm the genealogy specialist. And today I'm going to talk about research in Scotland. And any of you who talk to me at all about genealogy realize this is one of the parts of genealogy that is really my area of expertise. I have a graduate degree in genealogy from a Scottish university. Um, And so, you know, this is really where a lot of the meat of my knowledge is. <laughs> um, so I've tried really hard to not like try to put everything in this um, because it's meant to be an introduction. So yet yeah, tonight, the DNA um, is at seven. It should be in the email. You guys got the link. Um, and it's also at the State Library um, Facebook page. Um, if you want, if you're on Facebook, it's an event at the um, Facebook page for the State Library, so you can share it. Um, the land one is at 1 p.m. Um, so, so anyhow, let's. I will start sharing my screen. Um, that's the one I want. And I'm also, before I go any further and forget, in the chat, I am going to drop in a file that um, you don't absolutely have to have, but it's the um, it's sort of the problem that's going to be the backbone of this um, presentation. So let's go to the slideshow. And so do you guys have my PowerPoint up? Good, okay. So just a little background. Um, Scotland is part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Um, it was a separate country until 1603. And the parliaments of, um, in, and in 1603, King James VI inherited the English throne. And so he, was king of both. Um, he, the, but the parliaments didn't merge until 1707. And even after 1707, the legal system and the educational systems were separate. Um, and they still are. Um, one thing to notice is that, just for an example of how different they are, in Scotland, there's actually, if, if you're tried in a criminal court, there are actually three verdicts possible. Guilty, not guilty, and not proven, which is basically jokingly being called not guilty, but don't do it again. Um, <laughs> so um, that's just one of several different ways that it's separate. Um, it's the country is kind of divided into four regions and let me turn on the pointer so I can point them out. So here we have the map of Scotland. The highlands, which are this area and the western islands were Gaelic speaking until well into the 19th century. Parts of it remained Catholic when the rest of Scotland went with the Protestant church. Um, the, the Church of Scotland is what we would call Presbyterian here in the U.S. Um, although this northern part here of um, Lewis is actually heavily Protestant and is still very, you know, there's almost no Sunday shopping still. There was quite a fuss when they allowed the ferry to come from mainland Scotland on Sundays. Um, there's the central urban belt, 
which is this area from Edinburgh to Glasgow. And it includes Stirling, and some people even say it includes Perth and Dundee. But it's the area with most of the population um, heavily industrialized in the 19th century. The Clyde River, which is here by Glasgow, is was a, a world center of shipbuilding. Um, lots of engineers out of this area. Um, lots of innovation. Not, it's not surprising, for example, on Star Trek that Scotty the engineer is Scottish because of that tradition. You have the borders down here with England, um, relatively not populated, a few, few small areas of urbanization where you, in the 19th century, you had woolen and linen mills. So uh, Gala Shields, where my grandmother was born, was a center of weaving and industrialization for that. The border did change a fair bit over the centuries, not by a lot, but it went back and forth just a little bit. Um, and then the Northern Islands, Orkney and Shetland, and sometimes you'll see Shetland in older records look like Zetland with a Z instead of an SH. Um, had heavy Norse influence. They were part of um, Norway until the, they were a dowry for a Norwegian princess marrying a Scottish king in the 1400s. And so they would have actually spoken a, a dialect of Norwegian until it died out in the 16th and 17th centuries. You'll see it's not that far to Northern Ireland. So next week when I talk about Ireland, you know, it's still, there's a um, ferry that goes from here at Stranraer to Belfast. And even with going around this point of land and stuff, it only takes two hours. And it's been a two hour ferry ride since the 1850s. Um, so that there was a lot of back and forth. And this is one reason it's relatively hard to genetically pull out people who are Scots from people who are Irish is that there's enough back and forth that um, it just, it's not a, on the time scales we're talking about, it's not a, that genetically different to population. Whereas for example, the population in Orkney is actually genetically different from the rest of Scotland. Important dates to remember. 1746 was the end of the, the Jacobite rebellions against the English king, uh, the English monarchy. Um, the Scots were badly defeated. Um, it was sort of the last attempt at Scottish independence that had any real hope of working until in my lifetime. Um, it was a, a impetus um, after the, the battle, you know, and after they were defeated, the English made wearing tartan illegal, made carrying weapons illegal, um, made playing the bagpipes illegal. And so there was a fair bit, and, and there was a lot of disruption, you know, a lot of men killed in this. Um, so it was a, a prompt for a lot of the Scots immigration to places like the Carolinas and the, the Southern Appalachian Mountains, um, or some early immigration to Nova Scotia, um, and so on. In the early, from the late 1700s, ending pretty much by about 1830, many Scottish landlords and landlords in Scotland tended to be own hundreds if not thousands of acres of land, cleared their land of people to raise sheep because they could make more money from the sheep business, from the wool, than they could from renting to small farmers. And again, you get huge migration at that point in, the, in you know, from about 8, 
1790 to about 1830 to places like um, Nova Scotia, North Carolina, and you also get great movement within the country. You get people moving whose families had been shepherds for generations, moving to the cities to work in mills, um, or moving to small coastal towns um, to be forced into being fishermen rather than shepherds. Um, so there's a lot of internal movement in that era. And then in 1843, the established Church of Scotland splits into the, the continuing Church of Scotland and into the Free Church of Scotland. And there'd been earlier splits with different names, but they'd been minor. You know, there'd been break off Presbyterian churches before this. And we're going to see someone today in a record who was a minister in one of those earlier break off churches. But this was almost about a third of the churches breaking off. There were parts of the country where 90% of the population went with the Free Church. Um, some of it was social and economic as much as religious, because the established church was seen as the church supporting the um, uh, the big landowners who could either nominate or have veto power over who was the local minister. So there was that complication there. And we'll see how that really affected poor laws, because up until this point, um, poor relief had been done by the churches. So you'll all, there are traditional counties in Scotland. These have been rearranged. So for example, several of these down here near the English borders are now the borders council rather than separate counties. But most of the genealogical records are organized by these traditional counties. And so you will see references to Midlothian and to Roxburghshire and to Sutherland and such. Okay. Um, and so when you find somebody, it's, it's, when you find a record, you'll want to know what county a town or parish was in, because that's how you may find other records. So it's the same basic methodology as everywhere else, where you start with what you know, um, you really find all you can in the US. Um, there are some duplicates of names, particularly, for example, if you have that somebody was baptized at a St. Andrew's church. Andrew was the St. Andrew was the patron saint of Scotland. So there are a fair number of St. Andrew's churches. Um, and so you'll and the name stock that was used, especially for first names, was not that big. Um, and so I joke that when I went to find my William Patterson in Scotland, it's not that I found him. I didn't find one William Patterson. I found 157 of them, literally born within a 30 year period in the country. So how do I know which one's the right one without having done some more work in the US? And you work back from what you know. So the methodology is the same. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna do a bit of a case study. Um, this, the man here seated, is my great grandfather. He was born Peter McGee to a very poor Irish Catholic couple living in the slums of Edinburgh, who was adopted by a family named Jameson. He's shown here with his son, John, who was in the Canadian services in World War I. Um, and Peter was, evidently a good father, all sorts of other things, but he stunk at names. He absolutely, completely stunk at names. 
which has sent me on multiple wild goose chases because he also happens to have often been the informant on birth, marriage, and death records. So as you can imagine, he often goofed on the names on the records. I will say that my brother seems to have inherited this. I'm the genealogist. I have all these names and dates in my head. We were in our teens before my brother could remember the name of an aunt and uncle. He usually just called them the people with the driveway that goes like this and made a sweeping motion with his hand because their house was built into a hill and the driveway did to go down from the street and turn into their garage. Um, it's a good thing I was there when my dad died because my brother was dealing with the death certificate while I was dealing with other things and he could not remember our grandmother's maiden name, even though he'd known the uncle with that last name, my grandmother's brother had been alive again until we were into our teens. And so, you know, he knew who Uncle Jim was, he just didn't know what Uncle Jim's last name was. So it's a family trait. And so poor Peter has um, sent me on multiple wild goose chases. Oops, went the wrong way. So here's the big problem. This is his adopted father's death record. And it's, talk about creative naming. It's James Jameson. Um, he was a boot and shoemaker. When he died, his wife had predeceased him. So we, if you can see here, he's the, the widower of Margaret Guthrie. Um, I'll talk about why that says Guthrie in a little bit. Where he died, his age, father's name, Thomas Jameson, deceased, doesn't give an occupation. Mother's, maiden, mother's name, something Jameson, and this MS stands for maiden surname, Hislop, deceased, died of bronchitis. Um, there was a medical attendant, so the medical attendant certified it. Here's Peter's actual signature on the book. And he was present at the death. Well, here's the problem. I could not find a Thomas Jameson who was married to a woman whose maiden name was Hislop. Couldn't find one. And not just in the right area, I couldn't find one in all of Scotland in the appropriate 20 year period. So given how many mistakes Peter made on various records, I figured that there's a mistake here somewhere. And um, this is my adopted line. Um, I know this may come as a surprise to you, but I enjoy genealogy research. And given that I enjoy it, I've traced both the biological and the adopted line for Peter. I figured that they both influenced who they, he was. And so I was gonna trace both of them. And especially since it's my direct paternal line, it means my name's Jameson and not McGee. So this took me quite a while and I finally figured it out. But one nice thing about this, and one reason I use this as sort of the backbone of this presentation, is that this spans the 19th century. So we get both the earlier church records and the later civil registration. Um, can't solve this one with DNA easily. I found a couple descendants of James Jameson and Margaret Guthrie, but not well enough to use, um, not the right people. And even though one of them's done a DNA test, still hasn't helped. Um, but anyhow, so you know, I can't just use DNA to find this out. So the most of the Scottish records are online at scotlandspeople.gov.uk. And if you just Google Scotland's people, it comes up. The online portal of the National Records of Scotland, which there used to be the National Archives of Scotland and the General Register Office of Scotland and they combined into the National Records of Scotland. And so they have the pre-1855 old parish registers for the Church of Scotland, 
they have Catholic records, they have this all of the civil registration records, they've got wills, they've got valuation roles, which are basically um they're a combination of property assessment and tax roll or and renters, and they've got all the census. And I'm going to talk about most of these. So first, under vital records, the important date is 1855. Up until 1855, you have church records. Starting in 1855, um, you have civil registration. They have almost complete compliance from the start. There was a fairly big fine um, with civil registration if you didn't. So I'll talk about that in a bit, but I'm gonna start with the church records. Um, they were, um, the church, it's the established Church of Scotland. Um, they were kept reasonably well in some places, not so well in others. Um, there was a, um, from 1783 to 1794, there was a three pence stamp tax on registration. So almost nobody bothered to um, record anything for those 11 or 12 years. And it's interesting, they, um, they did have people check on the records at points. And so for example, um, the island of Fula, which is in Shetland, had the note on their records that owing to the negligence of the recorder and partly to the parsimony of the inhabitants who do not choose to pay the trifling fees of registrations. So if you have ancestors from that part of Shetland, you may not find a record. There's another parish, King Cardine by Menteith, where there was no minister for about a decade, starting in 1823, when the Reverend William McGregor Sterling was encouraged to leave the parish after fathering a child with his housekeeper. So, um, Obviously, if there's no minister, there's nobody writing down the records. There are some records within these. Because they were the established church and part of the government, you will sometimes find people who are dissenters in the, the break-off churches or Catholic in the records. For example, I found um, Peter McGee's mother, Helen Cassidy, in the um, who was Catholic, her death was, her burial was listed in the local parish register, even though she was not Church of Scotland. Um, marriages are the most often recorded, deaths are the least likely to be recorded, and they're the hardest to find because you will often get a listing that's just child of so-and-so or widow Campbell. Well, you know, if half the parish is named Campbell, which happened in places, um, Widow Campbell, without anything else, really doesn't help you. Other church records, come on, where are we? Oh, here we go. Um, most of the pre-1855 Catholic records have been um, digitized and they're available at Scotland's People which um, Scotland's People is a pay-per-view, it's not a subscription site. And what you do is you buy credits. And um, the way it works now, you used to pay a small amount for the search fees and then a slightly larger amount for the certificate. You now get the search results for free and you pay, it's six credits for an image, which is about, when, when you do the conversion, from British pounds, it's about $1.50 per image. Um, a few of these records um, from the old parish records and the civil registration 
most of the old parish records and some civil registration are indexed either at Family Search or Ancestry, but you don't get the original image, which you would want to do because there is definitely information in these that's not in the index. Other groups may have records from before 1855, but most of them have not yet been digitized. Um, it's a project they're working on. A lot of the free church parishes have not been good about allowing access. Um, there were also what were called the Kirk Session records. Um, these have been digitized, but they're not available online. You have to be in Edinburgh or half a dozen other places in Scotland where they have a, a link to the Edinburgh files. Um, but they are all of the times that people got in trouble for doing things they shouldn't have. And we'll see an example of that later. So anyway, here we have two sample baptism records. And this one on the left is from um, the early 17th or the mid 18th century. Um, and it says Ebenezer, son of John Hislop, heard in Wem, heard meant he was a shepherd. Wem is the place name, and Allison Law, his sp spouse, baptized by, and then they got the wrong minister's name, which they correct down here. Uh, witnesses were Thomas and Robert Murray, both herds in Bell's Bray. And then um, they actually say baptized by, and this was, the, it was a mistake. And they say it was a mistake. So um, that's pretty typical. You will get the child's name, the father's name, occupation. You'll get s often some type of residence, a farm name often. Um, if they don't live in a city, um, you'll get the mother's name, which is really nice. Um, and you'll also get the witnesses, which are often some connection to the family having the baptism. Um, and so that can be helpful with, I have more than once solved pulling apart two different families because it's not impossible to get two William Pattersons in a parish who are both married to women named Isabella. And so if you don't have the, if the minister didn't write down the wife's maiden name, you may have two families with the parents with the same name. And by looking at the witnesses, you can sometimes tease out which one belongs to which family. This one on the right is actually a Catholic baptism from 1832, and it's Helen, lawful daughter of Michael Cassidy and Mary Goodman, gives the birth date and baptized, um, and gives his witnesses Edward Blaney and Margaret McGrath. And I have not figured out who Edward Blaney and Margaret McGrath are exactly. I mean, I found out who they are. I haven't found out why they're connected. But here they're witnessing Helen's baptism. Her parents have, are both deceased by the time she's having children. And Edward Blaney and Margaret McGrath, who by this point has married Edward Blaney, are actually witnesses for a couple of her children's baptisms. So obviously there is a connection there, if nothing other than longtime family friend. So, um, and then here we have one, and I pulled this one because it's George Brown, tenant in Skirling Mill, and Janet Clark in this parish had a natural daughter. And in this context, natural means not lawful. In other words, the parents weren't married. Because you'll notice it doesn't say that Janet Clark was his spouse. So a lot of these records distinguish between lawful and natural as the way to go with 
legitimate and unle not an illegitimate. Marriage records. Um, here we have Ebenezer Hislop, the one whose baptism we saw with the um, mistake in it. Um, Mar in Margaret Nesbitt in the parish of West Gordon. And this is actually um, gave their names for proclamation to marriage, um, which means that they this is they've given their names to be announced in church. This is the bands or intention. So we don't know exactly when the marriage happened. Um, we know the month. Usually it happened within a couple weeks of the, the bands. Um, they, they didn't do it too far ahead. Um, and this has cautioners and then two names. Um, William Thorburn for Mr. For, for Mr. Hislop um, and Thomas Smith for Miss Nesbitt. And so again, these would be the, the people who are the witnesses, um, which is what cautioners means in Scottish records. Um, it's, it's a cross between a witness and a person guaranteeing um, that these people are able to marry, that they're not already married to somebody else. Um, you often get the bands in two different parishes if they live in two separate, if they live in two different parishes, it will be announced in each parish. Because again, the, the, the reason for announcing them was to say, these people want to get married. Are there any objections? Scotland also allowed what was called irregular marriages, where if two people stood up in front of witnesses and said they were married, they were legally married. The church wasn't a fan of this. And so the Kirk session records are filled with people basically apologizing and or proving that they were married, they were called irregular marriages. Um, so that's one of the things you'll find in um, in the Kirk session records is if two people were married by declaration, the church often pulled them up and said, you need to apologize before you can take communion. Um, they didn't have any legal ability to dispute it, but they could say you have to apologize before you can take communion again. Here's another one. Now here's, oh, I did find a Robert Jameson residing in Leith who married a Janet Hislop residing in Dalkeith, daughter of the Reverend Ebenezer Hislop, who's the one whose marriage is in baptism we just saw, who's the minister of the Burger Congregation, which is one of the small pre-1843 breakoffs. Um, the, so the bands were married, were, were declared, they were married June 11th, 1819, certified by Henry Jameson and John Miller. So those are the two witnesses. And so Henry Jameson is undoubtedly some relation of Robert, and I haven't figured out what John Miller's relationship in all of this is. I'm still working on that one. Um, then we get this. This is the James Jameson that adopts my great grandfather, marrying Margaret Guthrie. And again, you get name, shoemaker's so occupation, residence at Nine Riddles Close Leith, the parish of South Leith, and Margaret Paxton Guthrie residing at the same place, daughter of Robert Guthrie. So what's interesting is you often, it's easier if you have people with common names to track down the wife because it, they rarely give the father's name in these records, but they often give the mother, the, the wife's father's name. Um, this one did not actually give the um, witnesses, which is a shame because that might've helped with things. Here's another one. Um, this is 
Janet Hislop, who married Robert Jameson, Robert Jameson died sometime before 1845 or 1844 when his widow marries Gavin Chapman. Um, so he's a fireman in a steamboat residing at Nine Riddles Close. And notice it says Janet Hislop or Jameson residing at the same place, relict, meaning widow, of Robert Jameson Clerk Leith and daughter of the late Ebenezer Hislop Dalkeith gave their names three and, and the bands were read three times um, in public worship. Um, and so we know that Robert has died by this point. Um, I don't know what happens to Gavin Chapman. I have not been able to find that. I do, uh, you'll see later by 1871, Janet's living with her brother and using Jameson and the Chapman has just disappeared. So I don't know whether he absconded, whether he died. Um, I'm going to guess that it was not a happy marriage or she would still be using Chapman. Um, Death records. You're mostly going to, before 1855, have either a burial record, um, which includes what are called lair records, where if somebody owns a, a part of the, you know, a plot in the graveyard, you will get that they've added somebody to that plot, or mort cloth records, which I'll cut that to. So here's a sample. Here we have a William Little dying and it gives you the death date and the burial date. They're usually somewhere between one and four days apart. Um, so you see very nicely um, kept. You get um, Helen Cowan, wife of John Ireland. Um, you, for the men, you often get an occupation because for example, in this parish, there are a quarter of the people there have the last name Little. Um, and so they're distinguishing one person named Little from another. Here's one that she was from the parish. She died on board the steamer Clarence from London during the passage to Granton, but she's buried in this little parish in um, southern Scotland. And so the record is there rather than where she died um, for the, the burial records. And Mort cloth rentals, these are an interesting, um, fabric was expensive before about 1820. In 1800 in the US it took, and I, as far as I know the, the numbers are about the same for, for the UK, before industrialization, it took about a week's worth of work to get a yard of fabric. By 1840, that had gone down to about an hour's worth of work, which is where it's pretty much stayed since then. So parishes had shrouds or a mort cloth, a death cloth, that they would rent to put over a coffin, or if somebody was a pauper and didn't have a coffin, they'd put it over the person until they were in the ground. They put a few handfuls of dirt on it. When the um, mourners had left, they'd take it out and finish filling in the grave. And so most parishes had what they called their best cloth, which was often velvet and fancy and expensive to rent. And their common cloth, which was plain linen or woolen. And so here you get, um, and this parish actually, man, there were, most parishes just had one children's cloth, but this parish actually had both a best and a common little cloth and a best and a um, common large cloth. And so you get the large cloth for the lady Clementina Carnegie, the large common cloth for Thomas Brown, and you can see these are the amounts of the rentals. And that was one of the way churches made some money for the poor. 
is by renting out this cloth. So they kept track of the money more than anything. A um, couple more, just these are burial records. Um, this is a case, this is actually a layer record. And so everybody in here is related and they're all buried in the same little plot in the cemetery. Kirk session records, here's a great one. Th this day it was reported that James Weir, son to David Weir, and Helen Hasty, daughter to John Hasty, both single persons were found under cloud of night in an outer coal house in the minister's clothes or little alleyway. And it is suspected that they have been guilty of unsuitable behavior with each other. In other words, they were caught at least making out, if not more. And so before they could take communion again, they had to apologize to the congregation and admit that they were wrong. And some of these are great because you get cases where, um, you know, I've seen, I saw one case where a woman had like four illegitimate kids over 15 years and apologized each time. Now, why my couple greats grandmother who had four illegitimate children over 17 years, she was just late enough that the hold of the church, this was in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and so the hold on the church wasn't there. And so she didn't get called up in front to tell who the father was. Um, but you get this, you get women where, you know, it'll say she brought forth a child in uncleanness if she had an illegitimate child. Um, and as I said, they'll, they'll have irregular marriages they have to apologize for and so on. So the Kirk Session records, I really hope they find a way to put them online for us not in Scotland because they are great reading, let me tell you. Um, there's also Ebenezer Hislop, um, his son Thomas also became a, a minister and had an extended dis salary dispute that is chronicled in the Kirk Session records and in the newspaper and other places. Um, a lot of people in Scotland did not have gravestones. This one is that William Little I showed you who died in, in Traquair in the southern borders um, in 1850. It's no longer legible. Fortunately, in the 1950s, somebody had done an um, inventory to this, web, to this um, graveyard. And so I, I know this is his stone, even though it's not legible because of that inventory. But Scottish monumental inscriptions, if you get them, um, often have a wealth of information. This is Peter McGee Jameson's wife, the only picture I have of her and her gravestone with her and their daughter who died at 13 months. Um, this is a pretty simple stone by Scottish um, standards. A lot, as I said, a lot of people didn't have them in Leith where the Jamesons lived. It's estimated there's somewhere between um, 6,000 and 11,000 bear people buried in the churchyard, but there are only about 350 gravestones. So the chances are pretty good there, you're not gonna find one. Um, here are a couple that are random. These are not necessarily my family, um, but I wanted to show you the range of what can be on these. So here you have um, a couple and his mother and stepmother, you get a daughter um, and a brother. And it talks about um, where they lived and all of that. Here you have one that's in memory of Thomas Tullock, merchant and fish curer, where he died, his wife, Elizabeth Malcolmson, their daughters, Alice Tullocker Anderson and Mary Ann Tullocker Halcrow. And when they died. So you get the daughter's married names here. And this one's interesting. 
So you have George Watson Muir. He died where he died, when, his age, his daughter, his wife, and then his grandson, who was um, a son of, and tells which son he's the grandson through. And he was um, this, a midshipman, which tells you there's gonna probably be military records. And he was killed in naval action off Chile in, 1914. So, you know, there could be an, some of these monuments are very detailed. So, and many, many of these have been done in local history journals or other ways. Um, some are at Find a Grave, some are at one call, at a website called Deceased Online that also operates like Scotland's people on a credit system. Um, so they're, they can be a wonderful source. And I've seen them, you know, where they have one where, you know, you could easily then have another line here, you know, and son so-and-so who went to America. Um, so th they can be a great source of information. Um, so here we have, Starting in 1855 in Scotland, you have civil registration. They asked for a lot more information in 1855. So if you have a family in the mid 19th century, you wanna look and see if you've got siblings or other relatives for that year, because there was more information. Um, there's a hundred year privacy on birth records, 75 for marriage and 50 for death. But once that passes, they go up each year in January at Scotland's people. In 1855, and then starting again in 1861, a birth lists the parents' date and place of marriage, which I have found is usually about 75% accurate. It's not unusual if the first child was a five-month baby to have that fudged on a later child's birth record or even the first child's birth record. So here's a sample. Um, you, they were in ledgers. Um, this is my grandfather, Edward John Jameson, gives the t time and place of death. Here's Peter Jameson, sailmaker, Charlotte Patterson, Charlotte maiden surname Patterson, married 1883, June 1st. And St. Andrews in this case is not a church. It's a, the name of a registration district that pretty much overlaps with the parish of a St. Andrews church, but it's a civil registration district rather than the church name. And then the birth was registered by a maternal aunt, so this is one of Charlotte's sisters. Um, oh, I did blow it up so you can see it. So that's what you would find on civil registration. This is in 1855, it goes across two pages. Um, and so here we have Charlotte Johnston Guthrie. Um, she's the daughter of a Robert Guthrie who's um, a brother to the Margaret Guthrie who marries James Jameson. Um, and this tells his, um, because it's 1855, you not only get his occupation, and you get his age and his birthplace. When they were married, previous children, so they have one boy living and one boy dead and one girl living. So they've had this is their fourth child, one has already died. It does say her fourth child here because sometimes she will have had other children that aren't the, where the husband's not the father. Um, and so they, they keep track of it. Um, and then her information. Um, and who registered it. And again, you get, you can see, you get it signed by the father. 
who registered it. Um, this is a marriage record. Um, here you have Peter McGee, commonly known as Peter McGee Jameson, sailmaker marrying Charlotte Patterson. It says, um, after publication according to the bands of the United Presbyterian Church, which means United Presbyterian is often the, is usually the free church um, rather than the established church. You get the parents' information. You'll notice here, instead of Helen Cassidy, he says her name was Helen Norrie. You know, his bad memory for names strikes again. Although again, he's got a reason for this one. Her name shows up as Helen, Ellen, and Eleanor in various records. So I'm guessing the Nori may have been what his father called her you know, from Eleanor. Um, gives their age, where they're living. Um, she's still in Edinburgh. He'd grown up in Edinburgh um, and he's moved over across the river where he's a sailmaker. You know, for Maine, picture somebody who'd grown up in Castine, who's moved to Belfast to work, and goes back to Castine to marry somebody he knew from there. That's what's happening here. Um, if somebody was illegitimate, the way my great-grandmother Elizabeth was, there's no father's name. Um, this is the biggest hole in my family tree. DNA has not helped. There's absolutely, you know, Kirk Session records haven't helped. Um, and if I could have one miraculous genealogy answer, it would be what name should be here. But again, you get after the bands of the United Presbyterian Church, which tells you that they're, you know, not going to the Church of Scotland. Um, most marriages took place either at the bride's home or in the minister's, at the, the manse, the minister's house. Um, they were rarely in a church through the middle of the 19th century. It's a late 19th century innovation in Scotland. Here's a death record. So we have Margaret Jameson, married to James Jameson, bootmaker, address, parents' information. There was no um, medical attendant. Um, the widower is the one who it was the informant and the cause of death. And here's Janet Jameson, widow of Robert Jameson, who in most records is listed as a clerk, but for some reason here is a retired merchant. Um, we have here um, no mention of Gavin Chapman, the second husband. Her brother Thomas Hislop was the um, informant, was there when she died. So a couple things on names. One is, as you've probably noticed, women often kept their maiden names up through the middle of the 19th century. So here we have a census record and we have William Little with his wife, Margaret Gregg and their kids. And then her mother, Margaret Cant. Now in, in the US and in England, having this name instead of Greg or Gregg would um, say maybe she remarried, but in this case, it's her maiden name. So, and the other thing is there was a very, I don't want to say strict, but there was a, a very standard naming pattern where with the sons, the first son was named after the father's father, second son was named after the mother's father, and the third son was named after the father. And then for the daughters, it was flipped. It was the mother's mother first and then the father's mother. Now, obviously you get cases where two or three of these people had the same name. And so you could, you, you know, would get variations on that. Sometimes you will get 
the pattern broken because there's a prominent relative. Um, whoops. Um, if the minister's new to the congregation, you may get the first child baptized there, named after the um, the minister. Um, you may get a baby named after a, a midwife or doctor who delivered the baby, um, especially if it's like the 11th child. That's often when you get the midwife. Um, I've seen cases where if you have five sons and the couple has five sons and no daughters and has a sixth son, if the mother's named um, you know, Wilhelmina, they'll name the, a baby William because they've given up on having girls. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this screen for a minute and go into sharing a different screen. This is the handout. Oops, I need to. Oops, not cooperating here. Let me go into. Um, here we go. I'm going to share. This is what I put up in the um, the file in the chat. So you know, here's the dilemma. As I said, you know, I've got this James Jameson who married Margaret Guthrie, who's you know adopted son Peter. Said his parents, James's parents, were Thomas Jameson and something Hislop. And here I have a Robert Jamison married to a Janet Hislop. And so is this James Jamison the same person? And at least at this point, I figured out kind of what's happened. Because you know, here you have Peter McGee, who's born in 1861. We figured out that Robert Jamison died no later than 1844 when his widow remarries. So Peter never knew Robert Jameson, but Janet Jameson, who was alive, um, who he wouldn't have really met because he, she died about the time he was placed with the family, had a brother, Thomas, who would have been around. He didn't die until Peter was about 10. And so he would have been around when Peter was a child in this Jameson household. And so I'm guessing what happened that Peter Jameson with not a great memory for names to begin with in grieving his father, pulled out Thomas as the grandfather's name instead of the Robert that it really was. Does that make sense to everybody? Plus, I also wanted to show this because you get a, a nice, so here we have James Jameson married Margaret Guthrie. And if I'm right, this James Jameson, his father's name is Robert, and Margaret's father is Robert. So their first child is named Robert Guthrie Jameson. Their second child, who's a daughter, first daughter, is named for Margaret's mother, Helen Mercer. So we have Helen Mercer Jameson. Then the next daughter is named Janet Jameson, which would fit with Janet being James's mother, and so on. There were other children here that fit more into this pattern as well. And you get the same thing here. You get John, named for the grandfather, Ebenezer um, for the father, um, Allison for the grandmother, Janet for the mother, and so on. Um, so, you know, the, the naming pattern is pretty standard. Um, so I have used it more than once as a way of narrowing down um, 
who belongs to whom. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Come on. There we go. So I wanted to point that out that that's, and this is, we'll see this again with Irish records next week. This was really, you know, culturally very, very standard. Oops. Saw that I had a chat message and it's not showing up. So, um, Chat's not coming up for me, but I'll get to it, okay? So next in census, every person starting in 1841. Latest available is 1911. Um, one trick with 1841, they rounded the ages of adults down um, to numbers ending in zero or five. Um, you know, here we have James Jameson with Margaret Jameson and then Robert Guthrie and Helen Mercer Jameson. Um, and then here in 1861, you know, here we have Janet with her brother Thomas. He's the minister. And um, as you can see, he'd had no stipend for three years, so left the church because they weren't paying him. Um, so again, you know, you get the family here. Um, they had two rooms with windows um, with five people living in the, they took, even with only two rooms, they took in a border. Um, so very few people in Scotland owned their land. So you don't get as much, you get some wills and probate and deed and land transactions, but not as many as in the US. So what you're gonna look for as much as electoral registers, which is who's eligible to vote, valuation rolls, tax records, and poor law records are your next things. And I also have an example of a, a, um, an asylum record. Electoral registers are interesting there, there was a reform in who could vote in 1832. So before 1832, one person in, of every 25, 125, was eligible to vote in Scotland. So less than 1% of the population. In 1832, that changed, and one person in eight, so about 12, 13% of the population could vote. And that percentage kept going up until women got the vote um, in the 1920s. So they did an annual electoral register of who was eligible to vote, has less information than the census, but like the valuation rolls and tax records can sometimes fill in between. Um, some are held at the National Records of Scotland, some are at the National Library of Scotland, and, but, and a few have been microfilmed. Find My Past is evidently working on getting some of the early ones up on the, the internet. Um, valuation rolls are basically rental records, um, and you get the address or a description. Um, type of, so these are all houses, dwelling house, the address, who actually owns it, the tenant, and then who actually occupies it. And it's not unusual for these three columns to be three different people. This one, it happens that it's a fairly small landowner 
And so you get him renting directly to the occupier. And so this is in the late, this is 1895. And Edward Arthur is a mill worker and he's paying five pounds, seven shillings and six pence a year rent on a house in Southern Scotland. Um, in the slums of Leith, where the Jamesons were living, they were paying about seven pounds at this point for their um, two room apartment. So it's seven pounds a year. Um, you don't get a lot of people in this who are much more transient, like um, Peter McGee's parents don't appear in this in 1850. What they've done is they've got these for other years, but they've put them up at Scotland's people for the years in between the census. So they've got, you know, the census is 1851, 1861, 1871, and they've got 1855, 1865, 1875. Eventually they'll have all of them, but they started with the intermediate years. So when you get people like Francis McGee and Helen Cassidy who are renting one room and paying very little, they don't show up in these. But um, anyone who's a little more stable than that will. Um, there are tax records. Some are on but per person and some are on a fixed asset. Um, there are the National Records of Scotland. Um, some are at Scotland's places, some are at Scotland's people. Um, one nice thing is some of these go back into the 1700s. This is a horse tax from 1795. They taxed female servants, male servants, carts, um, clocks and watches, um, various other things. So these are mid range, these are farmers basically. Um, and you can see, you know, they have one, somewhere between one and seven horses. Um, this person has one horse who's not liable for the tax. But again, it gives you a location within a parish um, and from before 1800, which is really helpful because you know, you're getting this from before the clearances and when you've got people who they or their children will have left Scotland in the early 1800s with the clearances. Poor laws, and I know I'm running long, I apologize, I'm trying to keep this pretty simple. Um, from 1579 to 1844, the Church of Scotland administered it. Um, there was both indoor relief and outdoor relief. Indoor relief was the poor house. They tended to do that less in Scotland than in England. They were more likely to do outdoor relief, which is what we now think of as welfare. It was either a cash payment, help with rent, um, fuel for the fire over the winter. You know, sometimes it was a 50 pound bag of oats to help people eat through the winter. Um, it often gives parish of birth or where they've lived for the last seven years um, the person's name, age, children, whether they're dependent or not, religion, earnings, if they've got a disability. Um, if they survive, the local archives has them. There are a few at the National Records of Scotland, but mostly they're at the local archives. So for example, you know, if the ones for Dundee are at the Dundee City Archives. Um, Glasgow's are the best. They are incredibly detailed and they survive. Um, Edinburgh, all that survives is the, is the indexes that were printed every year. And so here we have um, wee little Peter at eight months old with his two older sisters and one older brother. This is a little before their mother died. I'd always heard that he was six or seven when he was adopted. And he was six when his mother died, or sorry, his sister Margaret, he was six and a half when Margaret got married. 
And so um, I'd always figured he was adopted and she got married because his father could no longer care for him without the teenage daughter at home. But it turns out that no, here he is being cared for under the poor law at the age of eight months. And here at the age of two, we see him placed with the Jameson family, which, so this explains how little Irish Catholic Peter McGee from the inner slums of Edinburgh got placed with a family, ended up with a family who was Free Church of Scotland living in what was essentially the suburbs at the time. Um, and one thing you'll notice here, notice that it's M apostrophe. Anyone who tries to tell you that MC is Irish and MAC is Scottish, don't believe them. It was often just abbreviated M apostrophe because you know, these were being typeset by hand. Things were written by hand. They were, you know, there was no consistency that lets you tell Scottish from Irish by that, by how the math at the beginning of the name is spelled. Um, so here's one. Here's Margaret Guthrie Jameson, and you'll see she's referred to as Margaret Guthrie or Jameson. And this is actually before Peter Jameson is placed with the family. She's in a mental asylum for almost a year because she thought people were trying to kill her. She had paranoid delusions. Um, and evidently she recovered. Um, a later page, this is actually a four page entry. So there's more in the entry about what was wrong with her, gives her address, gives her husband's name, gives some other information like that. There's a couple who run a website called scottishindexes.com who have um, done an index for these asylum records and then will photo, you know, will we'll scan a copy for you if you can't get to Edinburgh. Um, to look at them. They're actually doing an online conference in early June that I'm going to talk at um, online. So I'll probably tell you guys more about that when that happens. Um, so, but these are, with the 100 year privacy law, these are available. And people ended up in the asylums for all sorts of reasons that we would be surprised at now. Scotland has some of the best maps online. I'm not going to cover these today. Um, I'm going to do a separate maps presentation at some point. Um, but the National Library of Scotland, which is maps.nls.uk, um, has some of the best online maps and tools anywhere. Um, so anyhow, Here's the question then. So is that James Jameson the same one that um, I was looking for? You know, do I have one person or two here? And I did finally find a record that gave me the answer at least to my satisfaction. Um, any suggestions on what that record might have been? I've given you the answer in the presentation. You know, one of the things I talked about tells you that how I figured this out. So yeah, I've determined it's one person. So any thoughts as to what record might have done it? Nobody. No, not the, not the, um, it's not the asylum record. That happened a couple years before Peter James, because it's, it is the James, it's not the Peter to James, it's the James to Robert. 
Jameson and Janet Hislop that I was trying to prove. No, that, that shows Peter to James and that I was clear on, but it's, it's James to his father. No, I, okay, so let me show you the answer. Actually, let me go into the PowerPoint first and unhide the slides that do it. Um, so let's go into And now I lost, oops. Technology's great when it works. So here we have Robert Guthrie Jameson with his son Ebenezer Hislop Jameson. And so Robert, I will pull up now. I'll stop sharing this one. And I'll go in here. Um, and this is one reason um, I know I had it here. Um, come on. I can tell it's going to be one of those days. Can you? So yeah, this is a case where um, Give me a minute and I'll find it because it's easier to see. Um, so this is a case that where the naming pattern is what did it for me. Um, and I'd be willing to say that he is. Let's see, there's the one. There it is. Okay, let me share my screen again. Um, so what you've got here is so you know you have if this James Jameson's the same person, Robert Guthrie Jameson who's the, the son of James Jameson and Margaret Guthrie, named their son Ebenezer Hislop Jameson, which would have been actually the great grandfather. But this is a case where Ebenezer Hislop is such an unusual name that I'm willing to go out on a limb and say, yes, this is enough to with all the other evidence to say, yeah, this is the right one. Um, but you can see I made all sorts of other additions to this. You can, as my, um, I had done this out once with a, um, to help figure out what the problem was and, and how I wanted to word my research question. Um, so it's, it's very much a case of, you know, I know where he get, I now know where Peter got the Thomas. He didn't just pull that out of nowhere. It was his great uncle instead of his grandfather. And one of Peter's adopted siblings named a child for someone from that Janet Hislop's family. And there, there are others as well with the various children naming after people in the family. Um, one of the daughters names um, a child, Janet Landale, for the um, 
with her husband's name. So that ties it in as well. Um, so any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>